This morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you don't mind pulling out your Bibles, turn there, pull out your phones, your iPads, uh, text a friend to text it to you, whatever you need. The series that we have been going through is called Scandalous Church. It's been titled Scandalous Church, and I hope that throughout these sermons and you've heard, you've realized why that's the title. You see, this church in Corinth was exactly that. They were a scandalous church. We've seen in in many previous chapters that scandal filled the church of Corinth, that their lives were filled with controversy, their lives were filled with sin, but nonetheless, they were a church. Paul begins, Paul begins this book of 1 Corinthians referring to them as saints, those sanctified together being saints. You see, despite their actions, despite their scandalous behavior, the church in Corinth was a church. The reason I'm saying this is that means that all of Paul's writings throughout this book, all of these teachings that we've been talking about are for the, for the purpose of inter-church relationships. That the reason Paul is saying these things is for how we interact within the church. And that's very true of today's passage as well. 1 Corinthians 13 is often called the love chapter for reasons that we will see and will be very obvious. It has been used in thousands and thousands of weddings. It is the go-to passage for marriage. This is why I'm preaching this passage. This is the only reasoning I could come up with. It's like a pre-counseling type thing. Type thing. I'm getting married in three months, and this passage will probably be, probably be in my wedding. 1 Corinthians 13 is known for love. But Paul isn't talking about that we just need to go love everything. He's not saying what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No. He didn't get there with the other apostles and start jamming out, all you need is love. Do, 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 do. No, what he's saying, Paul understands that the most crucial thing for the unbeliever is faith. He understands that the most crucial, crucial thing for someone um, who has yet to know Christ is faith in Christ. But here, Paul is talking to a separate group of people. He's talking to people who have been sanctified, brothers and sisters within the congregation, and he says that the most important thing is love. Last week, we saw how spiritual gifts were being misused. Next week, we will see that even further. But right now, Paul presents the solution to those problems. He transitions from a point of despair and harsh criticism to a point of beauty and poetry. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. See, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I am humbled that you have given me the opportunity to deliver your word this morning. I pray that these thoughts, that these sentences, that these words I use are in no way Mark's words, Mark's thoughts, Mark's opinions, but they entirely your spirit's guidance. Father, I pray that you guide me through this passage 
as I guide your children through this passage. I pray that as we conclude in a few minutes that, that you will show us what love is. That you will show us what that next step, how we are to love. That you will give us reasons to love. We ultimately, we surrender this time to you. We want your name to be lifted high above all else. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Cookies and cream ice cream. The Ohio State Buckeyes. April Elaine Miller. And naps. What do all these things have in common? Well, let me tell you. All of these things have proceeded out of my mouth, followed by the phrase, I love. I love cookies and cream ice cream. I think it's the only way to go. I love the Ohio State Buckeyes. OH. Okay, there we go. All right, good. Just because I'm from Florida, it's all right, I'll forgive you. National champions, they're kind of a big deal right now. I love April Elaine Miller. She is the beautiful woman right there, and I am in love with her. But I tell you, I love naps. I love naps. Now, what's the crazy thing about this, all right? In our exaggerated culture, we apply this one word to mean so many different things. I use this one word to apply to my, my, my preference of an evening snack and also to the woman that I have the utmost affection for that I want to spend the rest of my life with. It is all love. On paper, I love these things. Well, to better understand ourselves, to better understand the church, to better understand our relationship as God desires, we must answer this question, what is love? A group of children, ages four to eight, were asked that very question, what is love? Let me share with you some of their answers. Elaine, age five, said, love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Amen. Mm -hmm. Carl, age five, said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving clone and they go out and smell each other. It's <laughs> all that happens, though. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Chrissy, age six, says, love is when you go out to eat and give someone most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Remember that. Noel, age seven, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. Aww. Lauren, age four, says, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all of her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> this was my favorite. Chris, age seven, said, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. <laughs> Channing Tatum. There you go. All right. Whatever, however love is defined, we can agree that it is difficult to do so. In the Greek, they had several different words to apply to this one word of ours. We've heard this, right? One of those words was eros. This is the, the sexual type of love. This is the type of, I, I love being loved by you type of love. Then there was the philea, and, and that's the brotherly or friendship type of love. The I love you so that you will love me, or I love you because you love me. But neither of these words are what's used in today's passage. 1 Corinthians 13 uses a different word, agape. This is one that a lot of us are very familiar with. It's very well known in Christian circles, and that's because it is prominently seen in Scripture. If you look at other Greek texts of the time, agape is rarely, if ever, used. But in the New Testament, we see it over and over again. And I would say the reason is, is because its definition comes from scripture. The best way to define love, the best way to define agape is by going to the words of God, by going to passages like this in 1 Corinthians 13. So what is love? Well, Paul begins by telling us that love is necessary. Love is necessary. In chapter 12, and as we'll see next week in chapter 14, Paul is discussing spiritual gifts. He's, he's discussing these gifts and the proper use of them within the church. But here in 13, Paul steps aside. He changes his tone, he changes his style to make a quick clarification. He says, all of these gifts are great and wonderful and so useful, but love is necessary. He says that love is necessary for the use of gifts. And our passage today goes through and lifts some gifts 
Oh, that's a hard one. List, list some gifts. He begins with the gift of tongues. Tongues needs love. Now, before we get into this, I want you to know that my purpose this morning is not to come to a firm decision on what the gift of tongues is. I understand it is a debatable topic. My purpose this morning is to communicate what Paul is communicating through this passage. And Paul is not sitting down writing 1 Corinthians 13 to clear up a confusion on the gift of tongues. He is writing 1 Corinthians 13 to say that we need to love. Tongues within the church of Corinth was being highly misused. It was being faked. The Greek word for tongues here is glossa, where we get our word glossary. It means languages. They were pretending to speak these other languages. And that's what Paul is addressing here with the Corinthians. He says, I I understand that you guys value this gift greatly, so much so that you're willing to fake it. But he says that is useless. See, Paul is using hyperbolic language. He's exaggerating here. He says, if I had the tongues of all men, if I could speak every language in the world, if I could speak every language that has ever been created, but I don't love, then it is completely useless. He's saying, I'll I'll take it a step further. If I could speak every language in the world, if I could speak the language of the angels, If I could speak how the angels communicate with each other, but I don't love, all I'm doing is making noise. Love is completely necessary. We also see that prophecy needs love. Prophecy was the gift that Paul valued most highly, probably because this is the gift that Paul had himself. The gift of prophecy is the gift of speaking truth into people's lives. Again, that's what Paul did. But even with this one, he says, if you have the gift of prophecy and you don't love, then you are nothing. In our culture today, there are hundreds of pastors who stand in the pulpit and speak truth. But I'm sure that there are many that don't have love in their heart. And what Paul is saying is that those individuals are useless. They are accomplishing absolutely nothing because more important than the gift of communication is the gift of love. See that prophecy needs love. We also see that knowledge needs love. Knowledge is greatly uh, valued in our culture. With great knowledge comes great power, great respect. But Paul goes here and completely confronts this idea. He says, no matter how much knowledge you have, if you're not a loving person, then you're going to accomplish nothing. He says, you could have every textbook in the world memorized. You could be writing the new ones. You could be coming up with these new ideas, but if you do not love the person next to you, then you are useless for the purpose of Christ. Knowledge needs love. Without it, it's nothing. Faith needs love. Again, Paul is writing to saints, post-conversion believers. So he's not saying that a salvific faith is useless, but what he's saying is that a miracle-enabling faith, he says, enough faith to move mountains. If you have enough faith to change the landscape of the world, but you don't have love, then that gift of faith is nothing. You are useless. Paul concludes with possibly the most shocking statement, though. He says that sacrifices without love are useless. Sacrifice needs love. He says if you give away everything that you have and give that to somebody else, nay, if you give away your life for somebody else, but you don't do it with a loving heart, then it is a waste. It's a waste. Yes, it is possible to sacrifice without love, and Paul calls that very thing nothing. See, these gifts without love are nothing. No matter what gifts we have, no matter what abilities, no matter how we view ourselves, it is completely useless if we're not loving the brother or sister in our congregation. This iPad is incredible. 
I was blessed with being able to get it before I started my master's work down here. And I tell you, I do everything off this thing. I take notes, I, I read my textbooks, I do work with it here. I can control the soundboard, the screens. I can do everything. I use it as a plate sometimes. It's great. Like, I can use this thing for anything. It is so useful. But my worst days are when I open it up and it goes black and then this little battery appears and starts flashing. I know that that day is ruined. <laughs> Why? Because as, as incredible as this iPad is, as useful as it is, as wonderful as it is, if there is no battery charge, then it is completely useless to me. It is but a block of, of metal and plastic. Without a battery charge, this is nothing, it means nothing to me, it just sits on a shelf. But when it has that charge, when it has that battery filled, it is incredible what this thing can do. That's what Paul is saying with our gifts. He's saying that, yes, I understand you can do incredible things. I understand that you have these amazing gifts, but without love, you are nothing. It is completely useless if you're not loving. The question, how often do we strive for the better known gifts? The, the, the gifts of the receive attention, the gifts of speaking, the gifts of prophecy. We so often try to be the, the iTunes or Safari, the ones that get the most use. But what Paul's saying is instead of trying to be these incredible gifts, focus on your battery. It says focus on loving the person next to you. You see, love is necessary if our church desires to be an effective tool for the ministry of Christ. If we desire to have union whatsoever, we must love. So Paul tells us that love is necessary. He also tells us that love is beautiful. Paul continues on his poetic portrait of love, as we mentioned before. It's difficult, like we said, it's difficult to define love, but as Paul defines it, he defines it with adverbs or ad adverbial phrases. All right, it's the same way if, if you were to ask me to describe a person, all right? So for instance, if you, if you asked me to describe Matt Kelly, many of you know Matt Kelly, but if you asked me to describe Matt Kelly, I would say Matt Kelly is, is funny. Matt Kelly is smart. Matt Kelly is, is, is a handsome man. Matt Kelly is single. <laughs> Matt Kelly is available after the service <laughs> for anybody who's interested. But it's these adverbial phrases that we use when we describe somebody that Paul is using here to define love, right? He goes through and lifts so many of them poetically. 15 statements, 15 phrases. It would ruin the poetry and the straightforwardness that Paul intends if we dealt with them very in-depthly. So I will hit on them briefly. We begin to see the portrait of love. The portrait of love. When Paul begins, he says, love is patient. This word in Greek is used many times in the Septuagint in the Old Testament. It's this idea of referring to long suffering, not with circumstances or happenings, but with people. This idea of being patient with another, despite what they do to you. A great example, probably the best in scripture, other than Christ, Acts 7, 59 through 60. It's Stephen as he is being martyred. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. See, Stephen is being murdered by repeatedly getting hit by rocks and stones. And in that moment, love wins. <laughs> love is patient. We also see that love is kind. Kindness is not simply a disposition. It's not simply a cashier smiling, with you, uh, smiling at you as she rings you up. But rather, kindness is active. It is the practice of useful, beneficial, friendly acts towards another. Kindness is not passive but it is going out of your way to be kind to another. Love does not envy. 
Love is not jealous of another's possessions, relationship, or status, but rather a celebration of the other's situation. Earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, Paul tells us that they had serious jealousy within their con congregation. Jealousy and strife that was leading to divisions within the church. It says, do not envy. I believe this is the, one of the most prominent issues in the church in the United States today. Both jealousy within a church and jealousy among churches create division and hurt the mission of the gospel. Love does not boast. This continues this point on envy. All right, love does not try to spur envy from another. We do not parade our accomplishments in front of another. That is not loving. This is something that is also actively done in today's churches. Think of some prayer meetings or small groups that you've been a part of. I, I pray that you would pray for my um, 40 foot yacht. It, um, I, I had to get a cleaning crew, but they're all busy in Europe right now with all the celebrities over there. So I'm gonna have to cool it down a little bit. So just be praying for it and I'm gonna have to get a new engine and that's gonna be a couple million, so. All right. Or possibly even our spiritual accomplishments. Uh, last week, I, I personally saved 45 individuals. They said that they looked in my eyes and they saw Jesus. <laughs> that was me. That was my eyes. They saw Jesus. So, so pray for me as, as I have to talk to them on a daily basis and, and um, help them just that, that, you know, I'm awesome. Um, this idea of boastfulness is so prevalent in churches. Among churches, it is very active. Love is not arrogant. You must not puff yourself up. This is viewing yourself higher than you actually are. This is thinking you are awesome when you're actually not, all right? Humility. Paul tells us how important humility is within the church. He even says this to the church in Ephesus. And speaking on the same thing, union within the church, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We see that love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. This conveys the picture of someone not behaving properly towards others or being self-focused. Paul, in right of this, may have been thinking of those who were pretending to have the gift of tongues at the expense of not benefiting the congregation. Or he may have been thinking of the wealthy who were taking the Lord's Supper, but in excess so the poor didn't have any. Whatever it be, those actions were rude and improper. How often do we have situations within ministries or even the parking lot where we are rude and unloving? Love does not insist its own way. One who is loving places others above themselves. They set aside, they set aside their desires for another's needs. Love is not irritable. He is telling the people of Corinth to not be embittered by slights, whether they're real or imagined. He says, take a breath. Stop getting angry over these things that you're imagining. Stop getting angry even if they're real. Love is not resentful. The Greek word here is a bookkeeping term. This idea of resentfulness is keeping a bookkeeping term, keeping tallies on somebody with the purpose of going back and expecting payment. He's saying, don't do that. Don't keep a tally of another's wrongs, but rather love is forgiving, it is gracious, it sets aside wrongs. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. We ought not rejoice at people's downfalls. We ought not rejoice when immorality is proclaimed. We should never rejoice with immorality, but rather let us rejoice with truth. We rejoice when truth is proclaimed, when moral behavior is proclaimed. This is very pressing in our country today. With the recent Supreme Court decision where immorality is being proclaimed as good, there's a difference though. 
There's a difference. Remember, Paul is speaking to Christians within the church, sanctified believers. He's not telling us not to show love to those who have yet to be transformed by the gospel. He's not saying apply this holy standard and force those to obey it without the power of the Holy Spirit. But rather he's saying within the church, within your brothers and sisters, do not rejoice at immorality, but rather rejoice with truth. He says speak truth into lives. Truths of scripture, truths of marriage are proclaimed within individual lives. This is a portrait of love. But we also see in these next few phrases the persistence of love. The persistence of love, meaning that it is an entirety, it is an entire thing that love doesn't have an end. This isn't I love you unless you do this. There are no stipulations or circumstances in which love ends, but love is always. See that love bears all things. A loving person endures afflictions without resentment. They deal with the struggles of the relationship. They bear these things for the love of the other person. We endure it without a grudge in order for the edification of the body and the glory of God. See that love believes all things. Now this does not mean that love is gullible or lacks common sense, but rather what it means is that it strives to believe no matter what the affliction, or I'm sorry, love puts the best possible construction on another's actions. That we strive to believe, again, not while being gullible, but we strive to believe it as truth rather than being skeptical. Love hopes all things, even when trust is broken time and time again, and belief is difficult, love hopes for morality to win. Love hopes even when hopes are repeatedly disappointed. Love endures all things. It endures struggles. It endures hurts. It endures harsh words. It endures unloving attitudes. It endures selfishness. It endures the load of every situation for the purpose of love. Paul beautifully paints a definition of love. My mother is not here this morning because she is at my sister's bedside in the hospital. If you want a picture of enduring all things, I believe there's none greater on this earth than Vicki Burkhold. Day in and day out, she is caring and concerned for my sister Amber. For the past 21 years, she has set aside her desires, her plans, her wants, her needs, to take care of Amber. She doesn't do so with expecting anything in return. She doesn't do so with resentment resentment or bitterness, but rather she is patient and kind with Amber. She does not envy or boast of her magnificent love, but rather in humility simply loves. She loves. Love endures all things. We see that love is beautiful. But Paul also tells us, he goes on to tell us that love is eternal. Let us read that concluding passage in 1 Corinthians 13 again. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. See, Paul gives us several illustrations to show the eternality of love. He begins by pointing out that our physical condition is temporary. He does so by pointing to the gifts that we currently use. And he goes through that list of gifts one more time. He says prophecy is an earthly gift. 
Prophecy is a gift that we desperately need while on this earth. We desperately need to be told truth on this earth. But one day, we will be in the midst of truth. Tongues, it's desperately a gift that needs to be had for the proclamation of the gospel. But one day, we'll be in a place where the gospel no longer needs to be proclaimed because we are living it and in the midst of it. It says, faith is a gift of this earth. Faith is believing what you cannot see, but we have the privilege of being in the presence of what we do see, our Savior. It says knowledge will pass away. Textbooks will no longer be used. Scientists will no longer be important. Knowledge, earthly, earthly, earthly knowledge, is temporary. It is a physical gift. All of these things will pass away. Paul then gives the example of a child. See, a child thinks and reasons and speaks differently than an adult. They have a partial knowledge, a partial understanding of this. In an article on Business Insider, people confessed areas of their life they did not fully understand as a child. Think back to when you were a child and how you explained some things. I'll give you two examples. One man said, as a kid, I always thought people changed the aisles and accessories in a store as soon as I stepped into an elevator. You step out of the men's section, door shuts, door opens, they've changed it to the toy section. I didn't realize this truth until I was five when I asked my father how the store employees changed the display items so quickly. <laughs> Another man said, hearing that God was everywhere at once yet invisible, I figured he was the one that opened the door at the supermarket. As a child, we come up with these understandings. We have these partial knowledge of truth. And that's what Paul is comparing us to while on earth. He says we have a partial knowledge. Our gifts are simply partial. He concludes then by saying that it is as looking into a dimly lit mirror or a fogged up mirror. Men, have you ever tried to shave after a shower? I did it this morning, it was a terrifying experience. <laughs> you're trying to like make out colors and shapes and then you're taking the stick with five super sharp blades to your jugular. It's kind of terrifying. Talk about living life on the edge. But Paul here is speaking about that's what we are in now. We might see shapes and colors in this idea, but, but it is just temporary. Because our spiritual condition is eternal. Our spiritual condition is eternal. In contrast to the other gifts that will pass away, Paul says that love is not simply an earthly gift, but one that will live on for eternity. Just as childish knowledge is temporary, we will soon realize that elevators move up and down, soon realize that doors open because of sensors and gears. Our knowledge grows and our knowledge will be complete one day. He then gives the example of the mirror. And as now we live with this fogged mirror vision, he says one day we will be face to face with our savior, with our creator, with the source of all beauty. Paul concludes this chapter by summarizing everything he said. He shrinks down all these gifts, all these ideas to three words. He says now these three abide, faith, hope, and love. Everything has been summarized in those words for Paul. But faith will pass away, as we said. Hope is hoping for something better, and we are going to be in the best place possible. There will be no need for hope, but love is the greatest of these, and that it is eternal. We have seen that love is necessary. We know that love is beautiful, and we know that love is eternal. But if that's not a good enough definition of love for you, we have the privilege of having love exemplified for us. We don't need to simply rely on words and texts, but rather love is exemplified for us. We know that Christ is the picture of love. John chapter 15 verse 13 says, greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. He said this just hours before he would go and do that very thing. 
He says, there's no greater love than what I am about to show you. He would go and lay down his life for all humanity. What is love? A nine-year-old girl named Kaylee who was being tucked in one night by her mother. Her mother leaned down and gave her a kiss on the forehead and told her, good night, I love you. I said, I love you too, mommy. As the mom was walking away, Kaylee couldn't hold in the question that she'd had for so long and she called out, mom, mom, what is love? The mother with a smile on her face went over. She sat on her bed, brushed her child's hair back. Without giving an answer of her own, all she did was reach over and grab the children's Bible that they had purchased for her that was sitting on her nightstand. Mother flipped through the pages and read these words. Next, the soldiers led Jesus toward a hill called Golgotha. They made him carry the cross on his back, but Jesus couldn't carry it the whole way. He fell down. The soldiers had whipped his back and it hurt so much. When they reached the top of the hill, they nailed Jesus to the cross. There were three crosses. Jesus was in the middle and there was a criminal on his right and on his left. Pilate had made a sign to put on the cross. The soldiers watched Jesus and made fun of him. They even divided up his clothes to be even more mean. And some people walked by and shouted, you saved others, why can't you save yourself? Jesus could have saved himself, but he chose not to. He wanted to save us instead. Later, Jesus could not handle the pain any longer. He said, it is finished. That is when Jesus bowed his head and went to heaven. The mother simply closed the Bible, looked at her daughter in the eye, and concluded her definition. Honey, that is love. You see, the moment that we try to define love by our actions, by our deeds, by our thoughts, we fail miserably. Love can only be defined by the actions of Christ. A picture of love is the picture of Christ. So what is love? Love is Christ's sacrifice. The perfect picture of Christ loving us in the midst of our sinful, rebellious condition. How do we love? Well, we are patient and kind and forgiving and endure all things just as Christ did for us on the cross. Why do we love? We love because Christ first loved us. We love because Christ first loved us. 1 John 4, 19 through 21 says this. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You see, we love others because we've had the privilege of being loved by the almighty God, the almighty creator. Would you stand with me this morning? Please, never, ever, ever, forget that you are entirely loved by the God of the universe. That despite your past, despite your thoughts, despite your actions, prior to walking in this door, God is offering his hand of love to you right now saying, I love you. I don't know about you guys, but I know my life. I know that that makes absolutely no sense. That I have disobeyed him time and time again that I've rebelled against him time and time again, how in the world could he love me? But day in and day out, he extends his hand of love to me. A sinner. A sinner that is solely saved by grace. Never, ever forget that you are loved. But don't just simply take it as a gift and that's it. You've experienced this great, magnificent love. You've experienced the greatest gift there is. Now go and share it. You have been loved above anything else. Now go and love. We're surrounded with brothers and sisters in Christ, many of which are dying to be loved, and this is where they ought to find it. Please, do not leave today embittered, angry, with resentfulness, 
being impatient and unloving, but rather leave here proclaiming the love that you have received from Christ and letting that pour through you as a love to others.